Good morning and welcome to the Lakers Lowdown. I'm Anthony Irwin. Today on the show, uh, the Lakers officially signed Anthony Davis to his extension and announced it over the weekend. Uh, winning time came back and I have a very special guest uh, to come on and recap episode one and maybe even recap all of Winning Time's episodes from here moving forward. Um, and then I'm opening up the uh, mailbag. So iTunes mailbag asked a really fun question that blew up Silver Screen's uh, Slack. And then I asked uh, for some questions on Twitter and got a couple more there. So yeah, busy show here this Sunday evening or Monday morning by the time you guys are listening to this. So let's go ahead and get to it. Let's start with the AD extension becoming official. Again, I gave all my thoughts on Friday when it was reported that he was uh, agreeing to the extension, but I do want to uh, further, I don't know, further explain why this is so important. And, and you know, Rob Polinka gave a quote in the press release that the uh, Lakers emailed me personally. And uh, they in it, he says that AD or Anthony is is uh, understands what is expected of him as a result of this extension and how he wants to be a leader in the organization. And uh, that, you know, this is this is a, a, a huge step, obviously, uh, in the relationship between the Lakers and Anthony Davis. So like building off of that sentiment. Um, I'm really curious what kind of quotes we're going to start getting from AD's camp, what kind of le leaks that we're going to start getting from AD's camp about the way that he's approaching this upcoming season. Uh, Jokic took it to him in the Western Conference Finals. There is no getting around that. Uh, and, and, you know, before that, AD was one of the most impactful players in the playoffs, right? arguably the best player in, in the two series that the Lakers had won to that point. Uh, and, and so still like Jokic, I, I, I talked to Adam Mattis like pretty regularly, even though he isn't on the pod and we don't pod as often as I wish we would. But uh, when AD took it to Jokic, the way that he did, he tells me that Jokic took that to heart. And that he realized he needs to get in better shape. He needs to, to, you know, bring more to the table on both sides of the court. And that that was like a real come to Jesus moment for, for Jokic. And, you know, now before the Jalen Brown contract, I believe Jokic had the most expensive contract in um, NBA history. And he could have won his third straight MVP this year if he didn't take the last half or the last like month or so of the season off. And, you know, obviously he goes on to win the championship that he did and en route to doing that really took it to AD. And, and uh, with this contract and with all of the quotes about, you know, Anthony Davis's um, role with the Lakers moving forward as a result of this extension, I am really curious if this is going to be the season that AD really comes back and he has a full off season um, and, and, uh, we just saw what, what Jokic did doing. I really hope that he takes and accepts the challenge of showing everybody again, that that player that we saw in that series is not reflective of a representative of who Anthony Davis is period in that kind of matchup. So, um, again, really happy for AD, uh, for, for, for getting that extension. He has earned it. 100% behind the Lakers giving it to him. Really cool that he and the Lakers were able to come to that agreement as quickly as they were and that this would be uh, officially announced over the first weekend that they could uh, potentially be able to do so. And then, you know, now moving forward is, is really where we're going to find out a lot about Anthony Davis this, this off season and this upcoming season and in those matchups against Jokic in particular. 
All right. Uh, before we get to the iTunes and Twitter mailbag, uh, again, I I uh, I teased it at the top and am really excited to throw to this special special guest to recap episode one of season two of Winning Time, which came back uh, from you know on HBO over the weekend. So uh, I'm going to get out of the way and welcome Mitch Kupchak. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to to recap episode one. Well, you know, uh, Winning Time is a a uh, a show on HBO, the Home Box Office Network. Uh, it it aired on Max, their new application after rebranding from. HBO to HBO Max to Max. Uh, I believe that that was a move to bring more people into the fold. And we will see how successful that will be. As far as the show, it opens with a flash forward which shows that eventually you will see a coaching change i don't believe i have to warn people people about spoilers because this is not fiction though obviously there are some moments where they hype up certain things and dramatize certain things for the sake of drama as a TV show. As an example, they show Magic Johnson going on to the court in 1980, and he leaves the tunnel, and the gym is empty. I do not believe that at any point in that season, Irvin Magic Johnson played basketball in front of an empty arena with no teammates or competition on the court. That was done purely, I believe, as a means to dramatize the moment. But you never know. I might, I clearly wasn't there. Otherwise, or uh, uh, other than that, in the, in the episode, I make an appearance. I didn't, say a line or anything, but you saw my name, cup check, on the screen, getting onto the bus before Pat Riley told us how much beating the Boston Celtics would mean. That was a cool opportunity for my name to be in that moment. I was indeed there on that bus when... We were leaving the arena, the garden, the Boston garden, after beating them in a playoff game. Uh, I don't recall Prince playing in the hallways as we were running to the bus. That what might have been further dramatization of the moment. But I do remember getting on a bus after winning a playoff game in Boston, and that felt pretty cool. And my name was there on the show, and that felt pretty cool. There was a nervous moment later in the episode where the actor who looked like might have been playing me walked across the locker room naked and you saw his buttocks, initially I thought that they were portraying my buttocks, but I don't believe they were. That, I believe, happened with a different player who wore a different jersey, different white guy that was on that roster. I was not on that roster. So that was certainly... A moment in which my eyes were pretty wide open, 
but that was not my buttocks. All right, thank you very much to Mitch Kupchak for uh, that, man, insight into uh, what would it, what it was like to live those moments. Uh, good to find out that those were not indeed his 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 buttocks, his uh, his butt cheeks in that in that scene. That was a different white guy that the Lakers employed at that time. So that was man. I would I can only imagine what it was like to be in the Cupcheck house when when uh, you know because clearly he's gonna grade like is is that guy's butt better than mine is it is it not as good as mine was his more chiseled you know those are those are important details uh but yeah i believe mitch kupchak is going to be coming on here on monday uh well sunday nights after the airing of these episodes to recap what is one of my favorite shows out there going right now so uh, again thanks to mitch kupchak for for hopping on kind of All right, let's get to the mailbag. The first question here on the iTunes mailbag. And again, uh, for those of you who want topics on the show and you can ask about anything as uh, evidenced by this next question, you can ask anything and I will answer anything. Um, and uh, the, 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 the review reads as such. And again, if you leave a five-star review, I will answer those questions guaranteed. This comes from El Hefe. Uh, 17, I'm, I'm guessing it's El Jefe, um, if you, if you say it properly. Love the show, 10 out of 10. First off, love the show. When the Vox layoffs happened, I kept telling my wife about your potential comeback updates because I was so excited for you to come back. Thank you very much. Now for my question, what is one of your worst, most in ignorant takes that you can remember? For me, it was when the Lakers got Nash and Dwight. I thought we were going to be dominant. I look back and see uh, that we added old injured stars with a coach that runs a system counterproductive to a counterproductive to our players' best strengths. Um, yeah, I was pretty high on that team though when they hired D'Antoni. I was certainly uh, a, that that made me raise an eyebrow. Um, I crowdsourced this, so I'm kind of cheating here. <laughs> Uh, but the, the the people in, in the uh, Silver Screen Slack really enjoy uh, telling me when I am really wrong. So when I told everybody, hey, this is a question that somebody has for me, uh, it was the first time in a while because we're, you know, very much in, in, the, uh, in the middle of the NBA offseason. Uh, it was the first time in a while that we have seen multiple people or, you know, Slack will say several people typing. They enjoyed this one. <laughs> So I'll give some highlights and then I'll pick from uh, some of them. So um, Harrison apparently has an entire uh, <laughs> has an entire folder on his phone for this one. And uh, he gave the example right from the get-go of my response to when the Lakers let Kobe design a uh, uniform uh, and, and how I... I, you know, from what I remember, I said that it's like evidence that they can't move past this guy. Um, I did not know at the time, and I should have known, but I did not know at the time that they were going to just, you know, they were going to cycle through great players uh, designing those jerseys. A practice they have since, since stopped. Um, you know, they, 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 Kobe did some, and I think Magic did some. Magic was responsible, I think, for the worst one yet. Those like, pinstriped purple ones that look like now and laters um those magic did it i think kareem did it i believe Shaq did it and kobe's was actually like the best one so far those mamba laker jerseys were, were were pretty sick and uh yeah that was that is definitely one especially given recent history that i would absolutely walk back and completely distance myself from that that did not age well, and it was stupid at the time. Um, as far as other ones that I gave that <laughs> hilariously I'm inclined to kind of defend, uh, but, you know, Jacob Rude, who's been on the show previously, Brandon Ingram, show me one skill. Julius Randle jeopardized his career by not playing in a summer league. Anthony Davis should miss a three a game were some of him that, that he gave. Uh, Harrison just... 
pulled up the tweet where I said that LeBron looked washed. Uh, in my defense, he had just been blocked in a game-winning shot by Mario Hazonia. Um, I compared Ben and Ingram to Kyle Anderson uh, and said that Luke Walton should resign to help himself not get, you know, have the crap rubbed off of him uh, by, at that time, an inept organization. So again, I would now, look, look, Luke was a bad coach, so, like, that is the part of it that aged poorly. But also, that was when Magic was running things and he was bad at his job. Um, <laughs> the an, Another person brings up uh, my Brandon Ingram take, which I'll defend here in a second. And Harrison, this wasn't a bad take. This was a hilarious like comparison that I that hopefully Jen isn't listening to. But I compared Jen to Robert Sacre <laughs> in that summer that you had the Robert Upshaw and uh, Robert Sacre competition for a, a roster spot. Um, and then uh, let's see. So I went to Twitter also when asked for it. Uh, more people brought up the uh, Ingram one as well. Uh, all right, so here's the thing about the Ingram one. It was on a podcast that Pete and I recorded, and I said that, uh, you know, it, we were talking about, like, expectations that offseason, and, and Ingram was coming off of a terrible rookie season, a bad one. Um, got a little better at the, at the tail end of the season, but when he was playing next to LeBron, it was super clunky, and, um, you know, it was just, it was just ugly. Uh, I think, analytically speaking, he had one of the worst rookie seasons that, like, a number two overall pick or maybe even rookies in general have had from a, like an impact standpoint. And I said going into that off season, you know, and, and asking for like what I would like to see from Brandon Ingram, I said, show me one NBA level skill, uh, obviously extreme. And he has certainly since done exactly that. You're all welcome. <laughs> but, uh, I, I wouldn't be as strong, but I cannot, like exaggerate how disappointing Ingram's rookie season was. And, um, you know, it's been cool. It's been really cool to watch him develop into the player that he has developed into. Uh, he is an elite wing playmaker, gets after it defensively, has gotten stronger. So he's actually like taking physicality to players at this stage of his career. And that has really changed things for him. Um, I would, I've been like hoping that the uh, Blazers would trade Dame to New Orleans for Ingram, though uh, apparently they aren't interested in, in that. So uh, still, I, I really love Ingram's game, and that was certainly a step, like probably like five or six steps too far in, uh, you know, crapping on what we had just seen from him. And I am really happy, as I always am. I tell, I always tell you guys this. When I am really hard on a player, when I doubt a player, when I don't like a player's game, I hope to be wrong about that player. And in this case with Brandon Ingram, I've been about as wrong about him as uh, as a person could possibly be. And uh, I'm I'm happy that that appears to be the case. Also, the Julius Randle Summer League thing, um, I can't believe I'm defending these. I, I can't, but like, I could just like give the take, laugh at it and move on. But I wanted Randall to play in that summer league. Remember his rookie season was like seven minutes long in terms of actual experience. And then he didn't play in the next summer league. And at that time, the Lakers had Larry Nance Jr. Who, um, I thought was a little easier to like fit into a, a winning equation. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, obviously that has been proven incorrect because Nance hasn't been able to stay healthy and Julius Randle has blossomed into a, a very good player, though not very effective in the postseason. I hope that changes. Um, and, and I said at that time that, if you know, because Nance did play, I believe in that in that summer league, and looked good at Randall's position. And I said that you know, if it comes down to a choice between the two of them, that the Lakers, you know, might move Randall for the higher return, 
Um, and and that like Nance showing in more occasions that he could play uh, would would maybe matter a little bit. Obviously wrong. Obviously a complete over uh, evaluation of the importance of summer league. A lot of times those decisions are made in part by the Lakers, right? Like we found out, we have since found out that Austin Reeves not playing in his second summer league was a Lakers decision. So it might have been the Lakers said like, look, man, you just missed your entire rookie season. We don't want to, you know, play you in games that don't matter. And and then, you know, held Randall out of them. And I can also see why Randall, a like, I think he was drafted seventh overall. Um, a top 10 pick in his second season would have said like, no, I, I, I also don't want to risk my body in games that don't matter. So, um, I understand it now. I'm happy that Randall has turned into the player that he has. And I hope that he becomes more impactful in games that matter a little bit more than he's been. But, uh, yeah, he, he appears to have avoided absolute disaster by not playing (laughs) in that summer league. Uh, yeah, I, I there are probably a zillion more. I've hosted a daily show now for almost a decade. So I've said all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stupid stuff. And I will probably say some stupid stuff moving forward. So get ready for that. The next question I believe is like uh, facetious, but I'll answer it anyway. Uh LZ Hunter writes, is Austin Reeves the best American-born white NBA player since Larry Bird? Uh, No, (laughs) he isn't. Um, You know, right off the top of the head, Gordon Hayward hit, you know, was better than Reeves has been to this point. Um, He was better for longer, too, which, which matters. I still think that, like, Alex Caruso, uh, was better for the Lakers than Reeves was. And, uh, you know, I wish that the two could play together. That'd be a really fun, good, confusing backcourt. Uh, but, but I, I just think Caruso playing a really important role. He started in the finals clinching game in which the Lakers at one point were up 40. Um, that, you know, that's a really good player to be, to, to play a part in that. So, um, I still think, you know, Hayward is quite a bit better than, than Austin has been to this point. Caruso, I would say has been like tangibly better than, than Reeves to this point. But I also don't think it's out of the question whatsoever that Reeves can have a season that brings him into that grouping. Um, and, you know, he could leapfrog Caruso in either this year or in a couple years, uh, especially if Caruso continues to deal with with injury issues. Uh, Gordon Hayward, obviously, has dealt with his share of injuries, so he is not necessarily the player that he was projected to potentially be, um, you know, as he headed to Boston. So uh, it is certainly within the realm of possibility that, that, that Reeves joins that conversation. He just, in my opinion, isn't quite there yet. I will say though, in in terms of like optimism, the clips that we're seeing come out, coming out of the the uh, Team USA camp that he's participating in have been really eye opening. Uh, he's getting after it defensively. He, he uh, appears to have like quickened his shot release, which you know with those guys they're trying, they're working their asses off in that camp. And that also is something that I'm really looking forward to seeing, like the impact of just playing in that environment, what that is going to do for for Reeves this season. Players tend to take real steps forward after that experience. So that's that's certainly exciting for Austin in that regard. But um, if if the uh, stuff that we're seeing from him is real, and given the talent defensively that is out there on the court, you know, what he has to do to be successful out there, and to hang in that environment is really impressive. So the fact that he has looked as good as he has uh, is is certainly exciting. Um, they are pretty talented at his position, so I'm not necessarily sure what role we'll see for him. But just just being there, especially given that he was an undrafted free agent like a year ago or two years ago, whatever it was, 
uh, is is pretty insane that he's already gotten here. So that's cool. Um, weird so far that like the people who are looking for engagement as it pertains to that team have uh, really focused the way that they have on Reeves. It makes me feel a certain way. Um, I, I, I think it puts him in a tough spot because, you know, he winds up catching shit for like being somewhat overblown by those accounts. And then, and, and he, by the way, would like not like that either. And then also like it, it, it raises expectations to a point that I, I don't like, I don't think really serve him. He's on an insanely talented young U S men's basketball team. And if he like doesn't play very much, it like wouldn't really surprise me because of how talented they are. And, you know, it would still be a productive experience for him, but it would become a joke and he would become a meme for something he has no control over. So, um, still, I'm really happy to see him out there, really happy to hear from varying reports and, and people that I've spoken to that he has looked good out there, and I'm really excited for what it means for him moving forward. All right, last question here comes from uh, Nathan Mark, two-parter. Do you know the deadline for when New Orleans has to desi- decide on either this year or next year's first-round pick? Uh, and going forward, now that the Lakers control all their picks except for that one, do you see them continuing the league's new CBA trend of not trading them? All right, so as I understand it, New Orleans can essentially decide like at the draft uh, or heading into the draft, you know, or once once like picks are solidified and all of that stuff, um, and and we'll know then like whether or not this is going to convey. Um, so at, like. I, and I'll and I'll like double check on that stuff. Um, at the very least, the next time I talk to Aaron, I'll, I'll ask him about it. Um, I'm going to be doing a show with Harrison tomorrow evening. Uh, I think the plan is like to go live at about 6 p.m. Pacific, so I'll have that figured out by then. So so tune in then, so I can clarify on that. Um, as far as the Lakers following the trend of not trading their. Um, their picks the way that other teams have been reluctant to trade their picks and especially first round picks it um it presents an an opportunity because if the price on first round picks is up everywhere else it means that the return on who you know what the lakers could get if they do move picks uh might become a little higher and uh so i don't think the lakers are like opposed to trading their pick uh, or any of their first rounders moving forward. I think if the right situation comes along and I think, you know, the plan. All right. So essentially what I, what I have, I kind of heard essentially is that like they are going to head into this off season uh, or this upcoming season with, you know, open minds essentially they are going to watch, you know, watch their team very closely, watch what's going on around the league very closely. We have to see what Dame goes for, what Harden goes for, and what that does to the market. Um, and essentially, they are going to collect as much data as they possibly can to figure out which deficiencies, because this roster is going to have deficiencies, which deficiencies they have to address and how far a pick, a couple picks, a young player might go in addressing those deficiencies. And the other thing too here is like with the Lakers, it's not just about, uh, it's not just about the market and what the actual return on a first round pick will be. It's also that RAD and LeBron healthy, because if you get to the deadline and they've been in and out of the lineup and in and out of the rotation or, or you know, whatever uh, because of injuries. And they continue to deal with that stuff in ways that they have the last few years. Like they had a really healthy playoff run and it wasn't a surprise. It shouldn't come as a surprise that the Lakers looked really effing good when they had both of those guys as often as they did during that playoff run. But in the run to the playoffs, 
They missed LeBron for like a month. And last season, they missed AD for like two different big chunks of time. So for the Lakers, they're going to be collecting data on their team and on the players and, and, and what the Lakers will need to add to their uh, to their roster over the course of the season. But they're also going to make their decision on whether or not they further commit to LeBron and AD based off of their ability or their availabilities over the course of the season. And, you know, look, there is no, there is no definitive answer here. This is not a, a defined science. The Lakers could trade those picks having seen LeBron and AD healthy over the course of the season to that point. And then right after they trade those picks and bring back a player that they think puts them over the top, boom, a turned ankle or whatever with one of one of those guys that makes you like kick yourself for trading that pick or using that future asset on a team that might not necessarily be going anywhere. So that's also going to be something that's that, you know, uh, might be playing in in the back of the minds of the people who actually have to pull the trigger on whatever deal. But I do think that this last playoff run uh, that we saw both the run up to the playoffs and the playoff run itself did show the Lakers again that with a healthy AD and with a healthy LeBron, the Lakers are as they, they are competitive with just about every team in the NBA. And with Denver potentially taking a step back, losing uh, Bruce Brown and Jeff Green, and with the East showing itself to be fraudulent the way that it did last year, uh, I, I, I do kind of wonder if that bar to commit to competition like that is a little lower this year than it was heading into last year. Um, I hope so. I hope, look, we all hope that, right? Like We all hope that over the course of the season, LeBron stays healthy, AD stays healthy, maybe a couple deficiencies show up here and there because they're going to, and they are able to address those things by way of, a D'Angelo Russell and picks trade, uh, that would be great. That's exactly what I what what I think we're all kind of hoping for, and certainly I think what the Lakers are hoping for. And if we do arrive in February with that as the circumstance, I don't think the Lakers are are absolutely opposed to moving their pick. But that's a lot of ifs. That's a lot of time between now and then, and. That's a lot of time for the market to kind of suss itself out too as well. And depending on how all of that stuff goes, that's when we'll find out what the Lakers wind up doing. All right. That is going to do it here for this episode of the Lakers Lowdown Podcast. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and thank you for your questions. Again, uh, if you have a question or a topic, any topic whatsoever that you want covered, Leave it in the form of a five-star review on iTunes, and I will get to it. Um, make sure you guys are subscribed everywhere that you listen to podcasts, as well as on uh, on YouTube. I believe we just crossed to 900 uh, subscribers on YouTube. That is 100 away from being able to monetize the thing, so that would be really nice uh, if you guys could, could uh, help me out there as well. Shouts to Mitch Kupchak for hopping on here and... Uh, reviewing winning time it's a really fun show i really enjoy it and i and uh and i was really happy to have him here to review it as well and yeah i will talk to you guys tomorrow